He is the worldwide symbol of rebellion and revolutionary struggle. His silhouette is familiar to billions, representing the epitome of cool anti-establishmentism. Yet few people know the real story behind the legend of Che Guevara. And in this week's biographics, we discover the man behind the myth to reveal an individual whose passion for social justice saw no bounds. Ernesto Guevara de la Serna was born on June 14, 1928, in the town of Rosario, Argentina. His family was aristocratic, with his father, Ernesto Guevara Lynch, operating construction and shipbuilding businesses. Born prematurely, the infant Guevara, who soon acquired the nickname Che, struggled with asthma as well as pneumonia. His mother was the dominant figure in his life, teaching him to read and write and impressing her belief in social justice upon him. Che was the oldest of five children. The family were exposed to a wide range of political and philosophical thought, with his father being friendly with many veterans of the Spanish Civil War. The boy developed a strong interest in sport, excelling at athletics, swimming, and rugby. He was known for his aggressive style of play and the mental drive to push his body to the limit. Che also developed a passion for intellectual pursuits. By the age of 10, he had become a very good chess player and a voracious reader. The Guevara home was overflowing with books on a wide range of subjects, exposing him to the ideas of men like Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Friedrich Engels. Che also showed a great love for poetry. In his early teens, Che's interest in the philosophies of great thinkers of the past led him to keep a personal journal in which he would summarize their main ideas as he formulated his own outlook on life. At school, Che, he was confident and determined. A schoolmate remembered him as incredibly sure of himself and totally independent in his opinions, very dynamic, restless, and unconventional. He acted more maturely than many of his peers and associates. While still in high school, he surrounded himself with university students, proving to be their intellectual equal and showing a political insight that often even surpassed theirs. On one occasion, his university pals urged him to join them in a political rally. He replied, Go out in the street so the police can hit us with their clubs. Nothing doing. I'll go and demonstrate only if you give me a gun. In later life, Guevara made a comment that was certainly the case for himself. A man of 15 already knows what he wants to die for, and he is not afraid of giving his life if he has found an ideal which makes the sacrifice easy. At age 15, Guevara's ideal was still in a raw state, consisting of little more than a passion for equality for all and a rejection of materialism. Still, at this age, he was more interested in sport than politics. He impressed everyone with his fierce self-discipline. His asthma made it a challenge for him to stay on the rugby fields, but he saw his condition as a barrier that could be overcome with sheer force of will. Che's self-discipline translated to his academic life as well. After graduating from high school, he completed a six-year university medical degree in just three years. His aunt later recalled, We would listen to him gasping, studying as he lay on the floor to ease his breathing. But he never complained. For him, it was a challenge. Che began his university studies at the University of Buenos Aires in 1948 at the age of 20. He refused to involve himself with the political movement against the Peron government, staying focused on his studies. He found his respite from academia on the back of his 500cc Norton motorcycle, which he nicknamed La Ponderosa, meaning the Mighty One. Yet, Che's first major excursion was actually on the back of a bicycle, though one that he had fitted a small motor to. In 1950, he embarked on a solo trek across northern Argentina that would see him pedaling some 2,800 miles. A year later, he paired up with a university friend, Alberto Granado, for a massive motorcycle trek across the South American continent. The two men traveled from one location to another, finding work as laborers as they went. At San Pablo, they volunteered to work in a leper colony. It was here that Guevara recalled seeing the most impressive example of solidarity and loyalty. And this was among men who had nothing materially. He was also deeply affected by the intense poverty that he saw in every corner of the continent. In his mind, this was an indictment of the failing capitalist system. 
Throughout the 5,000 mile excursion, Guevara kept a journal in which he recorded his experiences. These were later published as a book which was entitled The Motorcycle Diaries in the 1990s. The motorcycle journey proved to be a great turning point in Guevara's life. In 1960, he wrote the following. Because of the conditions in which I traveled, I came into close contact with poverty and hunger and disease. I discovered that I was unable to cure sick children through lack of means, and I saw the degradation of undernourishment and constant repression. In this way, I began to realize that there was another thing that was as important as being a famous researcher or making a great contribution to medical science, and that was to help people. His experiences over the course of his travels also had proven to Guevara that he could exist on very little. He had the ability to push himself forward despite food, water, sleep, or anything materially. These qualities were to make him an extremely effective guerrilla fighter. Guevara had taken a year's sabbatical from his university degree to embark upon his epic journey. Returning, he threw himself into his studies, graduating in 1953 to officially become a doctor. Two months later, however, he abandoned this career and stepped into the political arena. With another friend, Carlos Ferrer, Guevara headed for Bolivia. The country had just come under its first reform government. The big issue was the nationalization of the country's tin mines. A revolution was forming, but Che refused to be drawn in, stating that the revolutionaries were not concerned with addressing the causes of injustice, but were merely tinkering with the effects. Rejecting the revolutionary movement in Bolivia, Che and Carlos headed for Peru. Here, they found that they were unable to open any kind of communication with the downtrodden Indians who, according to Ferrer, stared at us lips as tight and forbidding as a vice that refused to reply to our questions. Still, the Peruvian border guards were sure that the two foreign upstarts were forming some sort of agrarian revolution. From Peru, they traveled to Guatemala. Here, a revolution had just taken place. Che had not yet fully developed a Marxist philosophy, but he felt a personal responsibility to help the downtrodden. His challenge was to find a workable way in order to do this. The new revolutionary government in Guatemala was led by Jacobo Arbenz, who had managed to pull together a group of young army officers and intellectuals. As Che arrived on the scene, Arbenz was in the process of redistributing lands that had been nationalized from the American United Fruit Company to peasant workers. The ever-present fear was that this would provoke a counter-revolution that would be backed by the Americans. Che wanted to work as a doctor for the Guatemalans in the jungles of Patan. However, he would be required to join the Guatemalan Labor Party, which was another name for the local Communist Party. Che refused to join, claiming that he was a revolutionary and that that designation superseded any political affiliations. The Arbenz government only lasted a year due to the feared American intervention becoming a reality. The CIA trained and financed a revolutionary group who managed to oust the sitting government. Caught in the middle of it all was Che Guevara, who commented, We are like the Spanish Republic, betrayed from within and without, but we did not fall with the same dignity. Finally, he committed himself to revolutionary action. Yet despite his best efforts, he could not rally the Guatemalan people for a consolidated defense. In the end, Arbenz weakly resigned. She had been marked for execution by the incoming regime and was forced to flee to the Argentinian embassy, where he was holed up for almost two months. His experiences in Guatemala convinced Che that America was the great enemy of worldwide freedom and that capitalism was holding people in a state of subjugation. It was at this point that he began to seriously study the works of Marx and Lenin. From Argentina, Che made for Mexico, where he began to develop his skills as a revolutionary. In 1955, he met Fidel Castro, who had been exiled from Cuba after a failed coup. Castro was actively looking for revolutionaries to join a second attempt to overthrow the regime of Fulgencio Batista. Che liked what he heard, and he enthusiastically signed up. The Cuban revolutionaries hadn't even left Mexican shores when they were intercepted by Mexican intelligence services and thrown in prison. It was Che's first experience of incarceration. The screams of his fellow inmates as they were being beaten and immersed in water, it had a powerful impact on him. Castro, though, he was able to exert influence through the Russian embassy that got all of the men released. From 1956, the small band of men were undergoing guerrilla warfare training on the Rancho San Miguel near Halco. 
Che proved to be the outstanding student among the group, despite his ever-present asthma. The 82 revolutionaries they set out for Cuba on November 25, 1956, on board a dilapidated yacht called Granma. None of the men on board were sailors, and they all got seasick, with most of the supplies being lost in a storm. They finally landed in a swampy area that led to a mountain range in the southeast of Cuba. For the next few weeks, they wandered around somewhat aimlessly. They found a guide, but he betrayed them to Batista's forces. The rebels were surrounded as they lounged around in the jungle with their boots off and weapons laid aside. In the ensuing firestorm, all but 12 of Castro's men they were wiped out. Castro he was wounded in the neck, but he managed to escape with four of his comrades. In doing so, he had to make a fateful choice. Of this, he later wrote, This was perhaps the first time I had to choose between my education for medicine and my duty as a revolutionary soldier. At my feet were a pack full of medicines and a cartridge box. Together, they were too heavy to carry. I chose the cartridge box, leaving behind the medicine pack. Jay led his group to the Sierra Maestra to meet up with any other survivors. He used what he thought was the North Star to guide him, but it was actually another star, and the group got hopelessly lost. They eventually arrived at the meeting place by sheer luck. For the next few weeks, the men had to rely on the generosity of local peasants just to survive. It was a small victory, and the group struggled to enlarge their numbers as they settled into life in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. Though few peasants joined the rebellion, they did build up a network of sympathizers. Any who showed any signs of allegiance to the Batista government were put to death, often on the orders of Guevara. It was during this time that Che developed the cold ruthlessness that he felt was necessary to the makeup of a revolutionary. Over the next two years, he was to order the deaths of hundreds of Batista followers. By May of 1957, the guerrilla force had been rebuilt to about 80 men, and they had built up a sizable cache of weapons. They overcame another army barracks, and before long, the entire Sierra Maestro region had become a liberated zone where Batista's forces feared to go. During this time, the rebel army had transformed itself from something of a clueless mob to an actual seasoned guerrilla force. This was almost entirely due to the training and guidance of Che Guevara. Castro had made him a commandant second in rank only to himself. As well as training the men in fighting tactics, he also established a field hospital, a tailor's shop, bakery, and a printing shop. Guevara also set up a radio station so that the rebels could speak directly to the peasant population. As a result of his prominent work at the core of the rebel army, Guevara's name came to the attention of the authorities, being mentioned in the same breath as the Castro brothers as an enemy of the state. Within the group, he also garnered his own loyal following, and in time, he would become a threat to Fidel himself. By the end of autumn 1958, the rebel force had won a series of victories in the south of Cuba. This precipitated Che's long march towards Havana, during which his small but determined force traveled by night and attacked the villages and towns that they encountered along the way during the day. The ultimate objective was to gain control of the province of Las Villas, effectively cutting Cuba in half. Che proved himself to be a brilliant tactician. He perfected the art of setting up rural bases, expanding them until a town fell, and then isolating cities and squeezing the resistance out of it. The final attack on the province's capital of Santa Clara involved a suicide squad attack that saw his men outnumbered 10 to 1. The victory that resulted was the most decisive battle in the entire revolution. With the rebel victory at Santa Clara and the rebels heading for the capital, Fulgencio Batista knew the game was up. He abandoned the country and on the 1st of January 1959 headed for the Dominican Republic with an alleged fortune of $300 million. The next day, Che entered Havana like a conquering hero. Fidel arrived six days later to proclaim that a new era had begun. The men who now inherited the governments of Cuba were predominantly uneducated and ill-prepared for the task. The clear exception was Che Guevara. While he had no direct governmental experience, he was a university graduate who was steeped in philosophical thought. Further, during the time in the mountains, he had proven his ability to organize men. Surely, organizing a country wouldn't be much more difficult. As a result, Che became the brains of the new government. For the next six years, he remained in Cuba, implementing his own form of guerrilla government. His first focus was to shift Cuba from an agrarian to an industrial society. 
In order to become independent from foreign imperialists, Cuba had to become self-sufficient. Che spoke less about the peasantry and more about the urban worker. In 1961, he was appointed Minister of Industry and instituted a program of converting agricultural implements into raw materials. To many people, by such policies, Che he was deserting the peasant class. Che never appreciated the complexity and financial resources that were needed to set up new industries. The factories that resulted ended up producing goods that were of low quality and high price. By the end of 1964, Guevara had established himself as an international expert on revolutionary action. During a three-month world tour, he visited China, North Korea, Algiers, Ghana, Tanzania, and a few other countries, espousing his anti-capitalist ideology and claiming that the Cuban Revolution was something spiritual that would transcend all borders. At the beginning of 1965, Guevara went to the Congo to lend his support to the revolutionary struggle there. For seven months, he led an Afro-Cuban force of about a hundred men. However, his movements were constantly monitored by the Congo National Army and the American CIA, and he was unable to make any traction. After spending time in exile at the Cuban embassy in Dar el Salaam, Che quietly returned to Cuba. Then, in October 1966, he slipped into Bolivia. There, he believed that he could ferment an uprising that would lead to the eventual overthrow of imperialism throughout all of Latin America. During his time in Bolivia, Guevara kept a detailed daily account of his experiences, which had been published as the Bolivian Diaries. The account reveals that the specter of death was ever-present. Though it is clear that he didn't go to Bolivia wanting to get killed, he was well aware that the odds of emerging from the struggle alive were slim at best. Che and the Cubans who came with him were not welcomed with open arms by the Bolivian revolutionaries. The Bolivian Indians they distrusted the Cubans as foreign white men. As a result, during the entire 11 months, Che was unable to recruit a single Bolivian Indian to his cause. Che divided his small rebel group into two divisions. He lacked the decisiveness and aggression of the actions that he had during the Cuban Revolution. He was also suffering physically at this point, with his asthmatic bouts becoming chronic. Still, his resolve to go on it never wanes. As long as he could breathe, he could fight. Each rebel division was systematically hunted down by the Bolivian forces. On October 7, 1967, an informant led Bolivian Special Forces troops to Castro's camp in the Euro Ravine. Almost two thousand soldiers surrounded the camp and moved in for the kill. All but ten men were killed. Guevara threw up his hands, and he yelled, Do not shoot! I am Che Guevara, and I am worth more to you alive than dead. The wounded Che was captured, bound, and taken to a nearby schoolhouse. Attempts to interrogate him failed as he refused to speak. One of the Bolivian soldiers present recalled that Che held his head high, looked very one straight in the eye, and asked only for something to smoke. A pipe was handed to Che, and he contently puffed on it until a Bolivian officer entered the room and grabbed it from his mouth. In response, Guevara kicked out at the officer. On the morning of October 9th, Guevara requested an audience with the local schoolteacher. The young woman was summoned, and she listened respectfully as Che brought her attention to the dilapidated condition of her schoolroom and contrasted it to the lavish conditions which government officials enjoyed. He told her that is what he was fighting for. The teacher, Julia Cortez, later related that she could not meet Che's gaze because it was unbearable, piercing, and so tranquil. Soon the news came through that Bolivian President Rene Barrientos had ordered the death of Che Guevara. Before the execution, the soldiers paraded him outside the schoolroom and took photos with him. Then he was taken back inside, where his executioner entered. Guevara stood as he spoke the last words to his killer. I know you've come to kill me. Shoot, coward. You are only going to kill a man. The assassin, a soldier named Mario Taran, then opened fire, hitting Che in the arms and legs. He was careful to inflict wounds in such a way that the story could be told that Che was killed during a firefight. The revolutionary icon was pronounced dead at 1.10 p.m. on October 9, 1968. The manner of his death created a martyr, while the substance of his life created a legend as strong today as it ever was. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos like this every Monday and every Thursday. And when you are hitting that subscribe button, do hit that bell as well because that means you will get notifications. If you just subscribe, you might, you might not. Who knows? So do click that as well. And as always, thank you for watching.